Hello everyone and welcome to tonight's presentation of OTF Connects, teaching math through problem solving using the three-part lesson with Mary Kay Gowindy. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight on behalf of Syria Skurhan, who's the administrator and facilitator of the OTF Connects program. Uh, we are always thrilled to have such passionate and excited teachers joining us from all over the province as the map indicates here, uh, to, uh, to extend their learning, especially in mathematics. We've had quite a few OTF Connect sessions on mathematics this year. That's been a particular focus area for um, some of our funding from the ministry. So this has been really, really wonderful. And uh, we're, again, thrilled to have you with us. And of course, we're especially thrilled to have Mary Kay here again with us tonight. Uh, Mary Kay's presented quite a few times through OTF Connects, as well as some of the other OTF PD the uh, projects that we've had on the go. And so thank you, Mary Kay. I'm going to hand things over to you now. Awesome. Hi, everybody. Thanks for uh, giving up an evening. To uh, I'm sitting in my basement looking at a computer screen, so you're probably in a similar situation. I just wanted to say um, the last time I got some emails after and people felt that they couldn't type in the chat because they felt they were being rude to me. You can have conversations with other participants in the chat. It's not rude at all to me. Maybe the best thing you're going to get out of tonight is a connection you make with another teacher participant. So, so please feel free to go ahead and use that chat for whatever. And the other thing is that um, this was a K-8 to focus. So what I've tried to do is focus on some big general ideas that would apply to multiple grades and probably even uh, subject areas outside of math. And um, I'm hoping that you will make the connection to your current assignment or, or what you might expect might be your next assignment. But if you're not able to make those connections, please um, grab the mic and ask a question. Or at the end, maybe I can answer any more specific um, questions you might have. Um, having said that, I'm glad you like that picture. But I mean, it, it's funny and sad all at the same time. And, and I think that picture is maybe um, a product of how math had been taught forever because we kind of had a culture of or a, a society of the haves and the have nots that they're those that people that do math and those people that don't and, and they're quite happy to admit I can't math and so we don't want that situation for our students in the future so we need to do something about that and this is maybe my favorite quote favorite picture too probably um, so we don't want the same um, situation for our students um, where they feel that they maybe math is too hard for them or they don't like math. So we needed to uh, look into changing how we teach math. And um, the three-part lesson came up. Uh, it's actually not new. Vanderwall talked about it 30 years ago, but in Ontario it came up, I guess, with the 95 curriculum. It um, became how we were expected to teach math, and now in 2015, we're, we're, we're kind of getting on with it. And I talked to my husband about three-part math lessons, and he said, well, that's how all my math lessons were taught. And I said, really? Because he's almost 50, same as me. And, and he said, yes, yeah, three-part math lesson. We took up yesterday's homework. The teacher did two examples on the board. And then we had the rest of the class to, to do our work. And I'm like, yeah, it's a different kind of three-part lesson at this point. Um, any comments? Any anybody want to say maybe why you're here? Grab grab the um, the tool, text tool, and right on the slide, write what you're hoping to get out of tonight's session, or a question you have, or I guess just in general why you're here. Before we get into the actual math. Oh, Ange, was I sounding like a chipmunk? I hate that. Oh, I love stepping out of a comfort zone. Awesome. More comfortable three-part lesson. Awesome. And for enrichment. Super.
while people are typing there, I forgot to point out one thing for you with that text tool. When you click on the text tool, another um, toolbar will show up, uh, a horizontal one below that tool strip, and you'll be able to select a different font size or color if you like. I'm just getting taking a couple notes here too, so I make sure I hit on all these points. Grab the mic too if you'd rather talk. Feel free if you're tired of typing. Perfect. Well, I I think I can address all of these, and if I don't, call me on it, and I can fix it at the end. All right, so um, this picture is of uh, Dr. Kathy Fosno. She's American, and she has done a lot of work in terms of students learning math. So um, she's a mathematician, but she's also done a lot of thinking on the pedagogy that best supports uh, students learning math. And she's come to Ontario quite a bit. Um, our ministry does consider her ideas. Maybe some of you and boards have adopted her landscapes of learning. And she does all those in terms of the building blocks that uh, underpin the big ideas in, in math. There's just a, uh, uh, her mini lessons are awesome. That's great, Melanie. Um, there's a little five minute video that I think Louise can help us get going. Um, I thought it's just a good beginning because I know a lot of us are a little bit anxious about giving up the drill and maybe the rote approach to math because possibly we learned math um, fine that way. But we are not the norm. And so this video kind of, um, for me, it relieved my anxiety about giving up the drill and possibly giving up some fluency. So I think, Louise, it's about five minutes. And so just watch it. And when you're done, uh, maybe give a green check. And also, um, Right on this whiteboard, any connections you've made or any ideas that really stood out. So right on this screen, you can um, write your ideas about that. Okay, so I am putting the link in the chat here, folks. I'm not going to open it up as a web tour. So go ahead and click on the link in the chat. It's going to open your own browser window, and then you can click play to start the video. And as Mary Kay said, when you're finished watching it, come on back and give us a green check mark and share your, your comments and thoughts on the screen. Thanks, Louise. So don't forget green check if you're done. And if the screen typing is too frustrating, feel free to just type your, your responses in the chat as well.
I see 17 green check marks. Hit the X if you are still finishing the video. I think that might be all the people that actually did watch the video. So let me know if you're not ready with an X. And there's so many great ideas being shared um, through type. If you want to grab the microphone, we're really kind. So it's maybe easier to share some of these ideas. I think I might be preaching to the choir in terms of the value on um, focusing on conceptual understanding over memorization just from reading your comments, um, which is really reassuring because a few years ago I did have to spend quite a bit of time um, encouraging people to maybe give up the, the rote drill and the memorization. I talk more about automaticity now than memorization from the outside. Um, I can figure out, um, let's say, 12 times 5 very quickly because I'll go 10 times 5 plus 10. Um, I can go so fast that you don't know if I've got it memorized or I just have automaticity in my strategy and the relationships I'm, I'm pulling between facts, um, which is really cool when kids start to realize that. Anybody else want to make a comment to some of these great ideas? I'm, I'm busy reading all these on the screen, but in the chat or on the screen or on the mic, Okay, I'm, I'm glad um, you like the tapestry quote. I do know that this video has made the rounds for PD, so some of you, it's not your first time seeing it, but it wasn't my first time either, and I always get something new out of it. Um, I'll share facts from memory so it looks different from facts from knowing. Hmm, yeah, think about that. So before we go into um, specific math things, there, there are three big ideas. Um, that I think are foundational for good teaching. So um, I just thought I'd, I'd share this because when I share these ideas and some of the math specific um, comments and suggestions I might make, um, you'll have a frame of reference. Um, so any, have you heard this quote before? Learning floats on a sea of talk. Green check if this is familiar to you. And maybe you want to grab the mic and, and say what it means to you. It's not a new quote, 1976 was, I think, when it was first said, um, the first time I could find it anyway. Um, and, and it's something I definitely believe in, that if there is learning happening, there's going to be talking happening. Um, I remember once I walked into the school and the principal said, oh, it's silent, isn't it wonderful? And I was kind of anxious because I'm like, no, it can't be silent, it's a classroom. It's got 700 kids under the age of 13 in this building, it shouldn't be silent. There should be talking and laughing and moving and all that kind of thing. So um, this whole thing of learning floats on a sea of talk, is definitely something I believe in. And when I think back to my, my classroom and my days as a math student, there was quite a bit of talk in my math class. The difference is, who was doing the talking. Absolutely. And so um, we have to shift and make sure it's not just the teacher doing all the talking. In fact, my goal is to do as little talking as possible. And that's really a goal. And sometimes I will stop mid-sentence in a classroom and say, I'm going to be quiet now because I realize I'm just enjoying the sound of my own voice and I'm not really doing anything to further the student's learning. But students are really good at talking. Um, they'll talk forever, but that may not move them forward in their math learning. So the, the challenge now for teachers is to take something that the students are very good at, talking to friends, and leverage that skill to help them further their understanding or further their learning in something specific to math. And there was a resource I found from the ministry. Um, there are actually quite a few, but these are two monographs called Grand Conversations in the Primary and Junior Classroom. And for example, this was um, one of the textbooks in the primary classroom monograph. And Louise will probably put the, um, the link for this monograph in the chat, so you don't have to go find it. It will be right there for you. This was one of the textbooks. And 
the context of it was in the literacy focus, but I looked at this and I made turn this exact thing into an anchor chart that I had in my classroom. And I just had it for student conversations. It really helped because kids know how to talk, but they don't always know how to pr talk productively about work that's going on in the room. So even by giving them these sentence starters, it really helped the, um, the accountable talk in my classroom um, improved dramatically. And I've seen it work. Uh, I taught grade seven and eight last year, and it worked very well at that level. But when I was curriculum leader, I had a grade two colleague that I was working with a lot, and she had the exact same anchor chart in her room, and her grade twos used it beautifully. So I think it, it's uh, for sure one to eight. You could have something like this. Maybe you don't put all those choices on for grade one, but um, something like this, I believe, is really important in the class, which means you're giving up instructional time and you're modeling um, how this gets used and you're giving students lots and lots of practice. Um, I've had some teachers who, when we talk about accountable talk, um, the first time does not go well, so they abandon that strategy. My thinking is always when something doesn't go well in my classroom, that's the sign for me to do it more often because the students need to practice it. And once they get good at it, then I can start to leverage it to further their, their learning. Uh, does anybody have a, uh, a comment about this? Or you maybe have something similar? Or you've got another way to support students? Student-student um, student conversations? You'll have the slide, and this is the exact text box that um, is in the link. So um, Louise put the link there. You'll get a PDF. It'll take you right to the PDF, and this is in that PDF. I hope that is helpful to you. If not, email me, and I can send you the slideshow, the exact slideshow, and it will be yours to uh, use or modify or just refer to as you need. And here's something from the other monograph, too, about um, grand conversations. Oh, sorry, I'm just referring to a comment that Dev uh, made in the chat about the respect. Absolutely. And isn't it awesome when students get passionate and want to debate with one another? But we just have to make sure you have the word there, respectful. Absolutely. I use tribes a lot in my classrooms um, just to help me build that culture of community. Um, where respect is really the only thing that's welcome in the classroom and, and disrespectful comments don't usually um, exist past the second week of September because we do um, embrace the tribe's agreements and build our community that way. So, but anything you can do to build your, your classroom community and culture of um, risk taking and safety and all those things, I will say um, it's worth giving up a lot of instructional time until you have that culture established. Um, the learning is probably suspect um, in any subject area, math and, and everything else. So this was a quote that I found um, on the screen now from the uh, junior monograph, and I liked it. It kind of goes to my point that um, there's a lot of teacher coaching that goes on. We can't just tell students to talk about the work. We have to get in there and coach them. Um, eavesdrop on conversations just like you'd coach in a sport or something else. Talk to the person having the conversation and say, you know, would you consider um, asking this question or I heard you ask this. Um, is there a more respectful way you could get that idea across? I am coaching on conversations all the time in my classroom, for sure, for sure. Um, any other comments about that? So my first um, big idea then, learning floats of a, on a sea of talk. So in our math classroom and in any classroom, we want to do anything we can to support student-student conversation. I just see a question. Uh, more coaching strategies? Not tonight, but I would love to do um, a pedagogical coaching uh, session. Maybe um, not coaching teachers, but coaching students. 
um, in terms of all their learning habits. I think that'd be a great session. <laughs> we'll write that down. <laughs> here's, here's the second big idea. Again, grab your whiteboard tool and um, mark on the slide your reaction to this comment. Grab the mic if it means something to you or type in the chat if that's the most convenient place to chat about this. Can you make any connections to this? Ah, happy face. And that cognitive dissonance is kind of that feeling of, ah, I don't know what to do. The students almost panic, but it's not quite the really negative panic that's going to shut them down. It's just that, oh, something here that I don't know, I've got to figure this out. It's really engaging that cognitive dissonance. And, and a lot of people are now realizing that Students like math when it's through problem solving because there's that I've got to figure it out um, kind of energy and students love that. All learners love that. We're wired to want to learn. That's how our brain is, is wired. Um, I think we got away from it for a while. We have to start leveraging it. Yeah, too easy, too easy is practice and too easy is disengaging. Um, so you have to have that level of struggle. Which again goes back to you need that respectful climate and that kind of accepting safe culture in your classroom so that this isn't always the source of tears um, for students. They have to learn how to handle this frustration and then work through it to learn something. But think about that outside of a math classroom. I mean, all of us as adults find something that puzzles us and we can't just quit. We can't just walk away. We can't just go to tears um, and, and give up on it. So learning how to deal with this cognitive dissonance is possibly more important than any math they're going to learn as they're going through it. I'm just reading. Yes, maybe panic was the wrong word. But there's that, ah, i got to get through this. Oh, I love that about teachers making mistakes. We have to make mistakes and tell kids we make mistakes and explain to kids what you did when you didn't understand and tell them about when you learned this. Because I'm pretty sure some students think that we were born with all this information in our head and that everything comes easy to us. And that's a, a very dangerous um, charade to, to perpetuate for our students. They need to learn that we're struggling and we're constantly learning new things and we give up an old idea when a better idea comes along. The wheels need to be turning. And turning, even if they're turning in the wrong direction, it's still better to have the wheels turning. We can, we can change the direction um, once they get themselves going. Awesome. And maybe, maybe some of you have seen this um, in a link I'm going to share later. There's a, a video put out by Joe Bowler. And basically, she's talking about, um, wouldn't it be great if a student brought home a perfect math test to their parents, and the parents said to the student, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that the teacher didn't engage you and challenge you and further your learning with this piece of work. So the whole thing about getting everything right no longer is our goal, but making mistakes is our goal and learning how to get past those mistakes. and then making new mistakes and solving them and making new mistakes. So we have to see mistakes as being good things in terms of further learning. Uh, somebody said about the visual of gears. Have you seen the pictures, uh, the posters in the uh, EduGames resources about the math processes? Because they're all done as gears. And it's that whole thing about one idea turns another idea. So. Um, I can't tell who typed that, but if you don't know that, um, send me a message at the end and I'll make sure you see that whole gear poster um, series. I'm going to go on. Again, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. This is just a little um, short YouTube clip. I think it takes 30 seconds. And it's not at all about math, but maybe as you watch it, 
think about a student in your class who is struggling to solve a math problem and see if you can com make um, connections to this video and your math class. It's just a 30 second YouTube clip. There it is under parking a car. Click it and green check when you're done. Epic fail. See, I don't even have to talk with this group. I just ask a question and everything gets answered in the chat. So, Remember green check when you're done? Sarah, how do I do it? How do I do the uh, green check? Okay, it's right under your name. If you go to the far um, right icon, you should see a check mark. And if you click on the triangle there, you'll get options of yes and no. Click on yes. So I love all the connections that you're making to this um, the video to your math class. Um, is is unfortunately it was a woman who couldn't park and a man who came to the rescue. Um, not the stereotype, but the woman is not a better parker. The car got parked, but she doesn't know how to park a car any better than she did at the beginning. Um, I just think that this is a lot about um, math. The problem got solved. The right answer was, you know, arrived at but the student has no understanding. And I think about how many times maybe I went and asked the student, could I borrow your pencil? And then I just write something. In my head, I was just getting them started. And um, now my rule is do not touch the student's pencils or manipulatives. And I walk around with my hands in my pocket um, because I do not want to touch them um, because I agree completely. It steals their learning. Thus, the next slide. We have to do everything we can to not steal the student's learning. Yeah, everything goes faster if we pick up the pencil. The student's frustration disappears because the answer was solved, um, but the learning did not did not happen. And we have to make sure that we prioritize student learning ahead of getting the right answer. And I was going to say, I've showed that clip to my students lots of times to explain to them why I'm not grabbing their pencil and why I'm letting them go through the frustration. And then the students would say things like, I can help you park the car, but I won't park it for you. Um, and I don't know why they use that instead of, I could help you. Um, think about some ideas for this math problem, but I can't do it for you. But they would use the, the whole language about the parking of the car, which was great. It was part of our, our classroom culture. So the second big idea is that the cognitive dissonance has to be there for learning, I believe. And we have to make sure that to mitigate or to lessen that frustration for students, 
we don't steal their learning. And here's kind of a related quote out of another monograph. Give a second to read it. I used to think it was my job to make a lesson that was so clear that everybody could do it right away and all get the same answers and all their work would probably look like it had run through a photocopier. And I have now um, given up on, on that. That's not my goal anymore. Um, I like the, the messiness and the areas of gray. And I love it when a student takes it in a totally unexpected direction. I, I agree with the tears, too, um, slowing down to kind of go back to Deb's comment about the frustration. And that's why I dedicate so much of my September to this whole culture of problem solving and mistakes. And while I do get tears the first week or two, maybe, um, not from every student every day, but uh, I don't see them after September. Usually after the second or third week, they're gone. Um, but it took a lot of work um, to build that whole tribe's culture, a um, lot of instructional time dedicated to um, building partnership and conversation and kindness and compassion. And there, Louise put up the link to that monograph um, that the current um, quote is, is from. Third, um, transfer is the bottom line goal of all learning, not scripted behavior. Any connections you make to this quote? Grab the mic. Make a com uh, make a, grab a tool for the whiteboard. Sorry. No oh, wait time. Isn't that a challenge? Ten seconds seems forever. I put up fingers in my pocket. Ten seconds, three seconds, whatever I've decided is appropriate for that day. It's hard though, for sure. We're all working on it. That's the great thing about teaching. There's always something to work on. And it's great when, when teachers are willing to, to keep working on stuff. I have a connection to this. I was teaching grade 8 and um, I was doing the data management unit because the grade 8 geography is all statistics. So I thought, well, I'm going to do my data management first and then I'll kind of be, uh, the students will be well prepared for that geography unit before I get there. So I thought that the students really understood the data management. I was quite happy with their success through. And then I went to the geography and we started doing some graphs, some histograms, and they handed in garbage. And I kind of said to the kids, like, what's going on here? Why am I getting these kind of, you know, half, half attempts at this work when you could do them so well two weeks ago? And they said, oh, you want a, a math graph. You know, they didn't make the connection or they didn't transfer their learning because they tend to compartmentalize um, ideas into subject areas. And the reason the soccer picture is here is because I got this quote from a blog written by Grant Wiggins, and maybe you know his work. He did Understanding by Design with Jay McTeague and Grant Wiggins, and he's quite a big uh, guru, I guess, actually, in the States on assessment and on pedagogy. And he claims that his best um, learning for how he teaches uh, happened when he was coaching soccer. And he knew the girls, he was coaching a girls team, and he devised a drill that would really help them move the ball up the pitch. And they practiced, and they practiced, and they did this drill um, really well, and he was happy, and they went in the game, and the game started, and it was a disaster for his team. And he kept yelling, just like in the drill, just like in the drill. And the captain finally you know, put her hands on her hips and looked over at him. We're trying, but the other team isn't lining up like they did in the drill. And that's when he realized that learning one thing in a specific situation is only good in that specific situation. And so this whole flexibility, and I would say a lot of, um, I know I learned math with very little transfer. If I knew what strategy or what algorithm to use, I could do it very well. But when I wasn't sure of the algorithm or the formula, I was kind of paralyzed. Anybody else have um, that situation where they learned it in compartments and, and this transfer was quite difficult?
Oh, yeah. Way to go, Kristen. Confused. Make that science math. I don't know where kids get this whole holding on to science or to subject areas. Um, ah, classic learning behavior instead of actual learning. So I'm going to just let this kind of sit in your head and take you to another um, YouTube clip. Maybe my favorite YouTube clip and definitely one I show in September. I've showed it to every class. I even showed it to my kindergarten. And yes, it, it has been around and, and I do apologize if you've seen it. Um, if you've seen it, you've got two minutes of um, a break. But if you haven't seen it, for, show, for sure click on this link. Um, Louise put it there under escalator problems. And um, again, green check when you're done. I think you'll probably like this video. So green check if you're done and maybe grab the emoticon icon um, under your name and let me know what you thought of the video by the, the icon or the face that you pick. Oh no, disapproving. All right, Louise. Yeah, Melanie, and then I saw there was a thing on the news the other day that said it's actually discourteous to walk on the escalator. And I was like, I do it all the time. And they're like, no, you're not supposed to. And I thought, well, it's a good case in the world where we've got time on the news to have a, a clip on escalator etiquette. I thought, good. That's a good sign if that's what's on the news one night. I think that means the most people, I see 17 green checks. I don't want to rush anybody through it. So I think I see everybody's checks. And what about the connections on this to, to, um, to teaching math? Or maybe think of it from the student's perspective of learning math. Any connections you can make? I agree with you, Pamela. <laughs> I, I always thought it was oh, many ways to solve a problem. Students sometimes get paralyzed because they want to do the teacher solution. They could solve the problem, 
they could get from the third floor to the fourth floor by walking up the broken escalator, but they get stuck because they can't remember how the teacher wanted them to do it. And so I would say to kids, get off the escalator when they're stuck or they're trying to uh, perform the long digit algorithm and they can't remember and they sit there for minutes talking with a partner of, what do we do next? I can't remember kind of thing. And I'm like, the goal is to solve the problem. And I would just walk by and say, get off the escalator. It, it's time to keep moving. Oh, I like that, Stephanie, about the whole speed. Was that a chime? Because somebody's going to, to talk, Louise? I've got a ding in my ear. That was Ange. I'm wondering if Ange is having audio because I see the red symbols next to Ange's name there. Oh. Hmm, I'll uh, type a comment and we'll see. Okay, thanks, Louise. And Vilma, your comment there about students can't transfer the learning, if they can't transfer it, I would argue that they haven't actually learned anything. They've learned possibly or they are able to imitate, but they haven't really learned about that operation. Uh, going on, I, I really do love this clip. I do show it in September. Again, it's part of building my classroom culture for problem solving. It, it's okay to use different strategies or to use manipulatives in a different way. Like the escalator is designed to move student, uh, people up without them walking. But if you want to walk up it, you're welcome to do that too. Um, so I, I do like this uh, in my classroom. And I think a lot of you were typing about this idea. You can draw upon and apply what was learned to a slightly new situation. And so really those are my goals for teaching math. Um, learning floats on a CF talk, cognitive dissonance is a required ingredient, and transfer is my goal. And so all the things I do in my classroom are trying to achieve um, those three things. I'd love a whole lot of right answers and accurate calculations, but those are almost the byproduct of my goal. And they do happen a lot. I definitely, um, the right answer is still important in my math class, but it's possibly not the most important thing anymore. But here's the thing, uh, this quote is from John Holt, uh, my friend Brenda Sherry, some of you might know her. This is uh, her favorite quote um, with respect to, to learning and teaching. Because bottom line is, we can do a whole lot of things, but what we can't do is open up their heads and pour in the learning. The kids have to be doing the work because that's what learning is. It's the product of their activity. So if the learners aren't having activities, then they are possibly not learning, and that's not good in our classroom. So then we go on to the three-part math lesson. And it's really, I would call it a five-part math lesson, but that scares people. And the ministry documents call it three, so I'm sticking with three, but I'll show you how to break it down. And in terms of my math class, I try and keep it in this one, three, six um, ratio. So my mind's on is one minute in my kindergarten class right now. I'm teaching kindergarten. So I have 10 minute math lessons, 10 minute mini lessons. Um, my mind's on is one minute. The action part is three minutes and the consolidation is six minutes. So that's in a 10 minute class. But if I've got a 50 minute class, then my mind's on becomes five minutes and my action becomes 15 and my consolidation becomes 30 minutes. Um, but, and I think that while I used to actually set a classroom timer um, to keep me on pace to, to go from one part of my lesson to the other. I don't know if maybe I've just done them often enough that my pacing is more natural and it falls into this ratio. Or maybe I just don't really care so much. I might do a, a 2 2 6 or something like that. But I definitely um, think that generally this proportion is what's needed. But maybe your grade ones, if you're teaching grade one, are only going to handle a 20 minute math lesson. So maybe instead of doing um, one hour lesson in math, you're going to do three 20 minute lessons across their day. That probably makes sense to me for grade one, since uh, what I know about their focus. Um, but, but again, that's up to, to you to decide. You know um, what's best for your students. So those are the three parts. And in terms of uh, how it aligns, 
This is how the National Research Council describes learning. So this is a bunch of neuroscientists talking about how learning happens. And they talk about it in three phases. Activating prior knowledge, which is what I do in my mind's on. Builds conceptual understanding, giving them a chance to wrestle with new ideas, and they'll either assimilate it or accommodate it into their schema. That's the action. And this whole we reflect on our learning is metacognition. So this whole three-part math lesson is actually aligned with brain science and neuroscience. And if any of you have used the new OFIA lessons, they're all three-part lessons. And I think um, anything um, coming out now from Alaska in the social science, I've also seen three-part lessons. So it's not just a math, um, good pedagogy in math, it's good pedagogy in all subject areas because it aligns with, with how our brains learn. So when I start, um, I always start my planning from the action phase. And the action in terms of the problem solving, that's when the students are going to be coming up with the, um, the problem, or that's when they're going to attack the problem that's the base. And where I start to come up with my problem is this book right here um, is definitely where I start. I always go to the curriculum. Um, one, because uh, right under a lot of the specific expectations, they actually give you a problem. So if there's a problem attached to the specific expectation, that's the first problem my students do in the unit. Um, I figure it's not up for me to kind of question. I just use what the ministry has already decided is a good problem to address um, that expectation. And I love this curriculum because of this. So there's two parts to our math curriculum. There are the processes. And those are the seven processes there. There's seven, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yes. And I see the processes as things that I coach students on. So I coach them on their selecting tools or how they represent their math ideas um, orally or when they record it on paper or maybe through technology. And I coach them on reasoning and proving and how they justify their answers. Um, and sometimes my learning goal for a lesson will be one of the processes. That's what I want to work on. That's my instructional focus or my learning goal for that class. And then there's the other part, which are the expectations. Um, and I think this is what we tend to focus on as teachers. But if you haven't read about the processes, I would suggest that that is something you um, dedicate a bit of time towards. It explains. Um, what they're all about and what teachers could be doing to improve students' work in these. Uh, right um, in the grade level, there's something about each process. And then the front matter on the curriculum, I think around page 17, but I could be wrong on the page number, um, there's some explanations about the processes as well. So I always come and I find a problem. If I'm not getting it right out of the curriculum, there's nothing wrong with going to a textbook and using a textbook problem. 